Well, it's been a great Sunday so far. We've got to hear from our younger kids, and Amy gave a wonderful children's moment, and from Becky, so we are going to continue that spirit now as we begin to look at some passages uh, during this season of Lent. As uh, Amy said, we are now on that 40 days of reflection and growing closer to God. And so in our passages, we're going to start off with a doozy. We're going to start with Revelations, okay? Or Revelation, excuse me. And so we're going to go with uh, Revelation today, chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. So I invite you that you can follow along uh, in your own personal Bible or Bible app, or we'll have the words of the passages on the screen behind me. So Revelations, chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. A great portent appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And she was pregnant and was crying out in birth pangs in the agony of giving birth. And then another portent appeared in heaven, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Then the dragon stood before the woman who was about to deliver a child so that he might devour her child as soon as it was born. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a scepter of iron. But her child was snatched away and taken to God and to his throne. And, to, and the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, so that she can be nourished for 1,260 days. And a war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But they were defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, you know, if you're going to get out there in the world, you're going to interact with people, multiple people. And some people are going to be really easy to get along with, really easy to talk to, really easy to have a relationship with. And some folks are just plain difficult, right? There are just some folks that are just hard to get along with. And I bet right now, if you close your eyes, you could probably think of a couple across your life that were just pure, what I call, knuckleheads. They're just knuckleheads for no reason of what it appears. Well, along my years in ministry, I have come across some knuckleheads, okay? Some knuckleheads. And that's part of the gig of preacher. Preacher, you're going to get some knuckleheads, and I remember one time I was having a real difficult time with this one individual, and one of my mentors said, you know, Brian, think about it this way. Sometimes it is the devil that you know that is better than the devil that you don't know, right? And so what that means is sometimes you have to deal with difficult people, and sometimes it's better to deal with that difficult person because if you didn't, there may be someone even worse coming along, right? So we all have to deal with that. So sometimes it's better the devil you know than the devil you don't. Well, in Lent, what we're doing here is we're calling our church into a time of reflection, a time of repentance, a realignment to God. But do we really know who our enemy is? Do we really know who the enemy is? I mean, we all hear the enemy is called the devil, right? The devil. But do we really know the devil? Do we know what we're looking out for? Do we know in Scripture what the devil has truly done? I feel like churches, of course, warn their congregations and their people, hey, be on the lookout for evil, be on the lookout for the devil. But they really don't talk about what it looks like, what it's done in Scripture. How can you know what to turn away from if you don't know the devil? And so this season of Lent... Our focus, Andy and I have talked about it, and we're going to be real intentional. A lot of our sermons are going to be very much the same because this is a, an important topic. But what we're going to focus on at St. Matthew's is the devil in the details. And so we're going to look at passages over Lent that deal with the devil, New Testament, Old Testament. Decided to start out with Revelation. That's the one that's got all the cool imagery and the symbols. And we're going to study it. So these, these passages are going to pretty much be a, a lot of details in it. And you've got little cards. Some of you have got these connect cards. You can write these passages down. You can take notes, whatever. Whatever will help you because I think it's important for us to understand who the devil is in order to know what we're turning away from. And so today's passage is a passage that comes from Revelation. 
It is it's John, you know, here on the island, and he gets presented with this great vision here. And he's telling us about this vision. And in this passage here, in this chap- 12th chapter, we get to the story, this vision of the woman and the dragon. And I bet as I was reading it, many of you were already thinking, okay, this is who the dragon is, this is who the woman is, this is who the child is. Well, let's, let's look at this particular passage. Let's break it down a little bit, and then we'll jump over to some parts of Scripture. We're going to be looking at multiple passages in Scripture that reference the devil and what that means for us, okay? And so we, we get here in the first verse, it says, A great portent or a sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet, And on her head, a crown of 12 stars, okay? And so in the Roman Catholic Church, you'll actually see this image a lot in this church. And this will be the image of Mary for them. They'll have an image of a woman clothed with the sun. And they call her the Queen of Heaven. And the Roman Catholic Church will a lot of times attribute this to Mary. But there are other traditions that say, well, this is also a representation of just Israel in general. And the 12 tribes of Israel, because Revelation was written all in symbols and signs, okay? Largely because at the time that this, this was written and that John received these visions, the church was under intense persecution from Rome. And so to get his message out and this vision out to the churches, he wrote in symbols and signs. And so for us today, we have to really dive into it and break it apart. And there's some things that we look at like this and like, oh, this could be Mary or this could be the tribes of Israel. Well, then you get to that point there. The reason why some people say it is Israel because Joseph, when he had a dream in Genesis chapter 37, in the dream, the sun represented Jacob or Israel. And so the stars in the sky represented the tribes of Israel. And so you get to see the imagery from the Old Testament brought into this New Testament revelation. It continues on that she was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And at this time, this child, many people will get to know that is Jesus, our Messiah. And the reason for the birth pangs is at the time that Jesus came into the world, there's immense pain. Immense persecution from the occupying Romans. It was a troubling time for Israel when Jesus came to this earth. And then it goes on and says that another sign appeared in heaven, a great red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and seven diadems on his head. Now we all know that this dragon here represents the ultimate big, bad, scary dude in the Bible, and that's the devil. The dragon represents the devil. The vision here is the devil. But when it comes, it comes with a crown pretending to be the king, pretending, lying, which is the characteristic of the devil that we'll get into. But you have this dragon that's coming down, appearing to be almighty and powerful, appearing to be the king. And it's here to come after the child. It says that his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to deliver a child so that he might devour her child as soon as it was born. Many people believe that there was a big falling out amongst the archangels in heaven. And that this falling out included the devil, who was an archangel, and rebelled against God, rebelled against the other angels. And in those moments and in that conflict, a third of the followers of the devil were swept out to the earth for them to roam freely. You know, many people believe that the devil was under the ground, and he's got these little red demons underneath there, and they're pitchforks, you know, and they're just down there causing trouble. The devil and the third of his army was swept down to this earth to where we live, to where we walk, to where we breathe, and where we sleep, and where we have relationships with people. That's where the devil and his angels were swept down to. And so this reference here comes from that. That's where they believe that in that time there is a conflict up in the heavens where the devil and his followers were pushed down to the earth. And then it said, at that time, when she gave birth to the son, a male child who was to rule all the nations with a scepter, but her child was snatched away and taken to God and to his throne. And then, of course, this is Jesus. When we read in the gospel passages, you see time and time again where the devil and his demons would pop up, where they would show up, where they would try to make Jesus fall, where they would try to have him fail in his mission. 
Just as Amy said, when Jesus was beginning his ministry, he went out to the wilderness. He fasted. And there he was tempted. There the devil came. And so what you have here is that the devil will come, of course, or will send his angels or his demons at the time of weakness. At the time of weakness. And so what happens in those times of weakness is there's an eternal battle that goes on within ourselves. You know, when we, when we look at temptations, when we look at temptations, what that is is temptations is the external thing that's pushing against us, okay? It's pushing against us. And the evil forces know kind of where our weak spots are, so they will amplify those temptations. They will present them. They will push them on us. But ultimately, who decides to fall to those temptations? It's us. It's us. And so what we see in the garden, if you go back to the garden with Eve, presented with the forbidden fruit, you see the, the devil is presented as a serpent in that story. But he didn't force the fruit into her mouth and force her to eat it. Not at all. He just presented it to her. And presented to her the temptation that, hey, you know what? God doesn't really know what's good for you. This seems harmless, just like all the other fruit in the garden. Why don't you eat of it? That's what the serpent did. That's what the devil did. But it was Eve who took the fruit. And then Eve, who took the fruit, ate it, and then presented it to her husband. He knew better, too. But yet, he said, you know what? It does look good. I think I will. See, those were the internal battles within them, and they made the choice. You go to Jesus in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. When, the, when Jesus was at his physical weak point from fasting, yeah, he could have made the internal decision to, to fall to those temptations that the devil presented. When fasting, he said, hey, turn these stones to bread. You know you can do it. You're hungry. It's fine. Why don't you eat it? And Jesus could have. I guarantee you, he was very hungry. You give me 12 hours with no food, I'll eat anything, okay? So I can only imagine how hungry he was, but he said, no, I will not do it. So he resisted the internal pressures that I know that he felt, and he did not fall to those temptations, okay? So what happens is when the devil and his angels and his demons are working around, and when they're here on the earth with us, temptations can arise, but it's an internal struggle, And so, with Jesus here, resisting temptations, fulfilling his mission, when he was resurrected on the cross, there he sits at the right hand of God on his throne. And that is what this fifth verse here is talking about. Sixth verse, the woman fled into the wilderness where she was placed prepared in a place prepared by God so that she could be nourished for 1,260 days. And so, therefore, if this is Israel, then God will find a place for Israel to rest for his people. He will protect them in time. Verse 7, it goes back to this battle that was mentioned to where the devil and the dragon and a third of his army fell to the earth. One thing with Revelation, the timeline is not a linear timeline. It goes back and forth and bounces around a little bit, which makes it kind of hard to study because our minds like to say, hey, chronologically, how did this happen? But this is not how it happened. So it goes back to this war or breaking out in heaven. Where the archangel Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but they were defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. So this goes back to this major battle that was in heaven. Between the devil and his followers. And and Michael the archangel and his followers. And then at that point, which is hard for us to kind of grasp. But when you go back in scriptures, you can see that there's been moments where the devil was able to go and talk to God. But after this battle here, he was no longer allowed back into heaven. He was cast permanently down and out. And no longer there's a place for him to go. And so here you get a very vivid story, a very symbolic story of the, of the battles in heaven. How the devil and his angels were cast down. The story of God and Israel and sending the child to save us and protecting the child and protecting Israel. There's a lot going on here, but this is the perfect passage to start with. It's kind of almost starting with the big image here and then breaking it out. And so the devil, 
What does the Bible say in other places about this creature? This creature. Well, you can write this passage down. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it predict, predicts him or depicts him as a lion or a fake lion. It says, Discipline yourselves and keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Like a lion. But you know who else is the lion? That the scripture says is the lion? That is Jesus. So the devil is walking around pretending to be almighty and all-powerful when we know that Jesus is the almighty and the all-powerful. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, it says, And no wonder even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. There again, another facade, disguising himself as the angel of light, but he is not. And so when you see here that he's a big imposter, he's a big imposter, even uh, John chapter 8 verse 44 says, You are from your father the devil, and you choose to be your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there's no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar, the father of all lies. And that's what temptation is. Temptation is a, is a big old lie. Hey, you know, if you, if you do this, even though you know that's not what you're supposed to be doing, no one's going to know. Big deal. It might feel good. You deserve it. Go for it. But what temptation doesn't tell you is that if you go for that a time and a time and a time again, eventually it will lead to your death. It just will. Oh, people who, who suffer from addiction just don't wake up one morning and say, Hey, I'm going to be an addict for the rest of my life. That seems like a good course of action. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It is a slow, slow build up and diving in and, and listening to those temptations and the battle within yourself and then you giving in to whatever you want to give into. And then before you know it, you're an addict. It leads to destruction. So he is the father of all lies. He's an imposter, an angel of light. He acts like a lion. But guess what? The devil is not more powerful than God. And I think many of us in our upbringing think he is an equal to God. And he is not an equal to God. At best, he's an equal to the archangel Michael. And to that, to that realm. But he is not more powerful than God. God was not created. But the archangels were created. Just as we were created. And so you have the ability, because of Jesus Christ, to resist. In James chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. In James, same book, chapter 2, verse 19, it says, You believe that God is one, and you do well. Even the demons believe, and they shudder. And so what you have here is that the demons and those of the devil will shudder in the presence of God. That as children of God, you can resist the temptations that's presented to you. You can resist evil. It starts with that internal conflict within you, but you can choose to resist it. You have the ability to do so. You know, a lot of times we will say, oh, well, the devil made me do it. No, you chose to do it. The devil just presented you with an alternative option. You picked that option because you thought it sounded great with inside of yourself. You thought you were going to take the easy way. No, the devil didn't make it. You, you did it. But not all is lost. There is a path to righteousness and salvation through Jesus Christ and what he did. It says here in John chapter 10, verse 10, that the thief comes only to steal, destroy, and kill but I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. That our life is not found in what the devil is promising us. Our life is found in Jesus Christ. That is where we find our hope. You know, God is everywhere. God knows us. But you know what? The devil is not God. The devil is not necessarily... 
The devil more than likely is messing with the, the big name Christians, more than likely. We get, we get the B team messing with us. We get those demonic angels and demons messing with us. But Jesus had the devil messing with him. I bet, I bet Billy Graham had the devil mess with him. Me? He probably sent his B team, C team angel to mess with me. Okay? So the devil is not everywhere. He is not God. He is not all-knowing, and you can resist him. He is not God's equal. And so what we need to look at as we go through Lent, like I said, there is so much more we're going to dive into this series of devil in the details. But I wanted us today to kind of understand who is the devil. Do we really know who the devil is? We have the ability to resist. Lent is the perfect season for us to pinpoint those temptations in our life and where his forces are trying to work against us and feel the ability to say no. No. You are not going to do this to me. I can resist. My God is stronger than you, and my God has saved me through Jesus Christ. So not all is lost. You don't have to say the devil made me do it. Because you don't have to. You don't have to do whatever you're facing. You can resist. Jesus won the battle. And so what I want us to do is is to focus on the areas of our own life, on us, focus on us, and see where we can resist the devil and his forces this season. Where can we give thanks to God for Jesus Christ? Where can we give thanks in our life for having a God that loves us so? So may we journey in Lent, focusing on those areas and turning towards God. Let us pray.